So there are actually two mathematically similar but not identical definitions of elasticity. In the first definition, we say that in an elastic material, the stress depends only on the strain. In the second definition, which we call hyperelasticity, we say that the work done by the stress in producing strain is stored as potential energy in a thermodynamically reversible process. We can write the first definition mathematically as the Cauchy stress tensor T is equal to a function of the strain tensor epsilon. Here we'll use the Cauchy strain tensor for these examples, but this could also be true of other strain tensors. In index notation, Tij equals Tij of epsilon KL. Now, if we were instead to consider the work done by the stresses, then an increment of work dW is T d epsilon, or T equals del W del epsilon. So Tij equals del W del epsilon Ij, where W, the work per unit volume done by the stress in performing strain on the material, is also known as the strain energy density function. So what this means is, for example, that we could define a stress-strain relation for a linearly elastic solid, as we've seen before, as Tij equals Cijkl epsilon Kl. Or equivalently, we could define the strain energy density to be the quadratic function of the strain, one-half Cijkl epsilon Ij epsilon Kl. So the, both of these definitions result in stress as a function of strain. The difference with hyperelasticity is the stress as a function of strain that's obtained by differentiating another function which represents the strain energy. This then enables us to constrain the possible forms of stress versus strain to be those that can be integrated to give a quantity that could be equal to an energy. An energy has certain properties that it must satisfy, like the first and second laws of thermodynamics. So for example, energy must be positive, and therefore, of all the possible functions of stress as a function of strain that we would could choose in a defining an elastic material, there's a more limited number of functions that are constrained by thermodynamics that we could choose for a hyperelastic material. So we can think of hyperelasticity as be meaning more than elastic in the sense that it's a more stringent definition than elastic. And when we're doing problems in nonlinear elasticity, we want to be able to avoid making mistakes by choosing stress-strain relations that may not satisfy the laws of thermodynamics. So by choosing strain energy functions that satisfy the laws of thermodynamics, we can then obtain stress-strain relations for elastic materials uh, that are more valid than any arbitrary function of the strain that we might choose based on some empirical observations. So the next question is, what does the strain energy mean in a reversible process? So to answer this, let's consider the conservation of energy which states that the rate of change of the internal energy per unit volume is equal to the rate of work done by the stresses plus the rate of heat absorbed. In other words, we can write rho di dt equals dw dt plus rho dq dt. Now for a thermodynamically reversible process, the change in the total entropy ds is equal to dq over theta where Q is the heat and theta is the temperature. Therefore, from conservation of energy, we can write that dW equals rho times di minus dQ, or rho times di minus theta ds. And we've already defined dW as being Tij deij. So this then tells us a little bit about the strain energy density and shows us that stress can arise from an increase in the internal energy I or from a decrease in the entropy S with respect to the strain. 
So some materials that uh, are very highly organized, such as collagen, and are known as crystalline materials, primarily store strain energy as internal energy in the bonds between the organized molecules of the material. Other materials, known as rubbery materials, such as elastin or rubber, store their strain energy as free or entropic energy, and the entropy or the disorganization of the structure decreases as the material is strained and under the action of stress. Now to go further, we need to recognize that the Cauchy stress tensor is Eulerian. So from Cauchy's formula, we can say that Tij is the component in the little xj direction of the traction vector Ti acting on the face normal to the xi axis. Where little x here are coordinates in the current or deformed state of the body. Now since the stress actually exists physically in the deformed or current state of the body, since that's what made the body deform in the first place, the Cauchy stress is sometimes referred to as the true stress. However, it's often convenient to use a Lagrangian measure of the stress, and there are actually two Lagrangian stress tensors. There's the partly Lagrangian nominal stress tensor, S, which is defined by a modified version of Cauchy's formula, shown here, where capital N refers to the fact that this traction is acting on a face defined in the undeformed state of the body. And so the components of the Lagrangian nominal stress tensor SRJ is a component in the J direction of the traction measured per unit undeformed area acting on the surface normal to the undeformed capital XR axis. So this is an, a Lagrangian definition of stress that is stress per unit undeformed area that is useful experimentally so that we can measure the cross-sectional area once instead of at every load, but has the mathematical disadvantage that this definition leads to a non-symmetric stress tensor because the transformation that transforms one of the indices from undeformed, the I to an R, from undeformed to from deformed to undeformed, leads us with this non-symmetric transformation so that S is not equal to S transpose. We need to convert both indices to the undeformed coordinates in order to get a fully Lagrangian uh, and fully symmetric stress tensor, which is called the second piola kirchhoff stress tensor P. And P then uses the deformation gradient tensor again to convert the other index of S, the J index of S, to uh, an uppercase, to an undeformed coordinate, so that the resulting transformation of the Cauchy stress tensor is det F, F inverse T, F inverse transpose, and that's a symmetric transformation, such that the second piola kirchhoff stress tensor is symmetric. So mathematically, the second piola kirchhoff stress tensor is just the Cauchy stress tensor with the I and J which referred to deformed coordinates, converted to R and S, which referred to undeformed coordinates, using the deformation gradient. And we don't need to derive this relation. It's sufficient to know that this transformation converts Eulerian to Lagrangian in this context. We can get a practical idea of the difference between these different stress tensors by considering a simple uniaxial tension case of a specimen with original undeformed cross-sectional area capital A and original length L stretched to new length lowercase l such that the new cross-sectional area is lowercase a by a force F. The Cauchy stress in this example is simply F over little a, the force per unit deformed or current area. The nominal stress using our formula S equals the determinant of F times F inverse times T, 
So determinant of f is deformed volume, little l times little a over undeformed volume, big L times big A, times f inverse would be the inverse of little l over big L, so big L over little l, times the Cauchy stress f over a. So you see that these terms cancel to leave uh, f over big A. So the nominal stress is just the force per unit undeformed area. Now the second piola kirchhoff stress, the one that's symmetric and fully Lagrangian, but a little more mysterious, P is equal to S F inverse. So S is F over big A, F inverse is big L over little L. So we just left with big L over little L times F over big A, which doesn't lend itself to an intuitive physical interpretation. But this is the consequence of transforming the Cauchy stress, which is really an Eulerian quantity, into a Lagrangian description. Uh, nevertheless, you can see that all three of them are involve the force divided by an area, and the question is just which area, and is there some normalization or correction factor uh, in the case of the second piola kirchhoff stress for the fact that the components of the second piola kirchhoff stress are referred to the undeformed state of the body. So what this means is that we haven't really changed our physical definition of stress. We have simply uh, shown that we can derive alternative stress measures that are Lagrangian. And the one that's completely Lagrangian, where both indices are referred to the undeformed state of the body, is symmetric. It's the second piola kirchhoff stress. Unfortunately, it just doesn't have quite as simple a physical interpretation. So normally, if we formulate a Lagrangian mechanics problem uh, in terms of the second piola kirchhoff stress, then once we've got the answer, we simply convert the second piola kirchhoff stress back to the Cauchy stress uh, using the inverse of this formula. So now that we have introduced the second piola kirchhoff stress and the strain energy function, we can now provide the constitutive law for a hyperelastic material undergoing finite deformations. The commonest form of this is the Lagrangian form, wherein the components of the second piola kirchhoff stress, PRS, are equal to del W del CRS plus del W del CSR, where C is the right Cauchy Green deformation tensor, so del W del CRS is just one half of del W del ERS and del W del CSR is one half of del W del ESR. Or we can simplify this to just del W del ERS, where the only difference here is that this form, writing the equation in this form rather than this form, uh, helps us to keep in mind that even though the stress tensor and the strain tensor are symmetric, a partial derivative of W with respect to an off-diagonal component such as E12 is technically the partial derivative of W with respect to E12 holding E21 constant. So sometimes the safest way to make sure that you differentiate your strain energy function properly is to write it in equal parts of the off-diagonal strain components so that and then differentiate it this way to be sure that we don't accidentally end up with a factor of 2 by assuming that since E12 equals E21, that one of these two terms is 0. So now that we have a Lagrangian statement of the constitutive law for a hyperelastic material, which is really analogous to the one we started with, where we this was Tij and this was Ij, the Cauchy stress and the Cauchy strain, uh, we can now invert the previous equation that we used to define the piola kirchhoff stress in order to recover the Cauchy stress, which is the, the physical quantity that is most useful. So that formula is Tij times rho over rho naught del xi del xr times del xj del xs times del W del ERS, which is just PRS. So this is just the formula on the previous page, inverted, where this is 1 over the determinant of F, and this and this term here are both F.
So now we can introduce specific strain energy functions with specific properties. And the simplest strain energy function would be a strain energy function for an isotropic hyperelastic material, in which case we can reduce W to at most a function of the three principal invariants of C, the right Cauchy green deformation tensor. Uh, that's because these quantities are invariant with respect to all rotations, and so this is a property of uh, isotropic materials, is that their responses are independent of the orientation of the tissue. So now if W is a function of I1, I2, and I3, to get del W del CRS we need to apply the chain rule, so then we would get del W del I1 times del I1 del CRS plus del W del I2 times del I2 del CRS plus del W del I3 times del I3 del CRS. Now, if W is given as a function of I1 and I2 and I3, then that means that del W del I1, del W del I2, and del W del I3 can be obtained by differentiating that function. So these are called the response terms. And then these additional terms here, since I1 is just the trace of C, and I2 is a function of the trace of C and the trace of C squared, and I3 is just the determinant of C, these derivatives can be computed and we won't do it here but if you did the algebra or you looked it up in a book you'd obtain the following result del w del i1 times delta rs that's del i1 del crs plus del w del i2 times i1 times delta rs minus crs plus del w del i3 times i1 times delta rs minus i1 times crs plus CRP times CSP. So again, this is just comes from differentiating the functions to define the first, second, and third invariants with respect to C. The algebra is a little bit messy, um, but this is the expression that you can now use to compute the piola kirchhoff stress components from the strain energy when the strain energy for an isotropic material is written as a function of the three principal invariants I1, I2, and I3. Most soft biological tissues are not isotropic. Uh, as we've seen, they're also nonlinear. So let's start by looking at two examples of nonlinear anisotropic strain energy functions, specifically anisotropic exponential strain energy functions. So some models of blood vessels have used two-dimensional exponential strain energy functions of the following form, first proposed by Dr. Fong. W equals 1 times constant C times e to the Q, where Q is the quadratic function of the strains, b1 e1 1 squared plus b2 e2 2 squared plus 2 b3 e1 1 e2 2 where c b1 b2 and b3 are measured material constants and e1 1 and e2 2 represent the normal strains in the circumferential and longitudinal directions so if we now derive the stress components for the strain energy function from PRS equals del W del ERS, we get that P11 equals del W del E11 equals C times B1 E11 plus B3 E22 E to the Q. And P22, which is del W del E22, equals C times b2 times e22 plus b3 times e11, again, times e to the q. So what do we see here? First, we observe that since the strain energy function is an exponential and the derivative of an exponential is an exponential, we still recover exponential relationships between stress and strain. But we also see now what the significance of the different coefficients b1, b2, and b3 is. You see b1 is the coefficient that determines the relationship between p11 and e11, and so therefore b1 is a reflection of the uh, exponential coefficient of the stiffness in the 
x1 direction, whereas b2 is the coefficient relating the normal strain in the x2 direction to the normal stress in the x2 direction. And finally, we see that b3 is an interaction term. So you see that b3 represents the influence of strain in the x2 direction on stress in the x1 direction, and on strain in the x1 direction on stress in the x2 direction. And this kind of behavior is exactly what's seen in blood vessels. So if we observe here, this plot shows force versus length relationships in blood vessels that have been inflated to progressively higher stresses. So this graph represents the relationship between axial force and length, so longitudinal stress and longitudinal strain, in blood vessels that are subjected to successively higher internal pressures, thereby affecting the circumferential stress and strain. And so what we see is that as the pressure rises for low axial strains, the amount of force required to stretch the vessel increases. Although interestingly, a point is reached where these curves actually cross over. And so at higher stretch ratios, it's actually easier to stretch the vessel at higher pressures than at lower pressures. So this suggests a, a nonlinear interaction between the axial stress-strain relationship and the circumferential stress-strain relationship. And this term B is able to account for that type of interaction. However, this is a two-dimensional constitutive law. Notice there's no terms involving strain in the radial direction, and also there's no terms involving shear strain, and so therefore shear stresses in this constitutive law would always be zero. So a slightly more general three-dimensional uh, constitutive law, which is transversely isotropic, uh, was derived by May Newman and colleagues for mitral valve tissue. And so what they did is again use an exponential strain energy function. But here the first term in the exponent is the first principal invariant I1 minus 3 uh, raised to the power of 2. So this is an isotropic exponential term. But then the second term involved lambda f, which was the stretch ratio in the fiber direction and the collagen fiber direction of the uh, valve leaflet tissue. And you can see that's raised to an even higher power. And so we we'll leave that as an exercise to you to derive the stress components. But you see now that this three-dimensional form will actually produce stresses in all three directions. Uh, but because it combines an isotropic term with a fiber term, it's like a isotropic material with different properties along one direction being the direction of the collagen fibers in the valve leaflet, which is the direction of higher stiffness. And so you can see that in these mechanical tests that those workers did, that when they do a equibiaxial test, so they stretch equally in both directions, you notice that more stress was required in the circumferential direction than the radial direction. So there's more collagen oriented circumferentially than radially, and hence the circumferential direction is stiffer. Now here's a couple of other tests. This one's an off biaxial test where the strain in the radial direction is maintained at half the value of the strain in the circumferential direction. And here's that strip biaxial test uh, where the radial strain was held fixed at and the circumferential strain was adjusted. Now, the solid lines here actually represent the fit of stresses derived from this strain energy function to those experimental data. So in other words, this is a remarkably good match to some complex experimental results using a constitutive law that only has one, two, three coefficients. So most soft tissues are incompressible or only slightly compressible, which can then affect the constitutive formulation. For incompressibility, we have the kinematic incompressibility constraint that I3, which is the determinant of F squared, is equal to lambda 1 times lambda 2 times lambda 3 all squared is 1 where lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3 
uh, the principal stretch ratios. So this extra equation that must be satisfied therefore means there must be an extra unknown, an extra dependent variable in the problem. That extra variable is the hydrostatic pressure P, which is added to the strain energy function as a so-called Lagrange multiplier. So for an isotropic strain energy function, W would now only be a function of I1 and I2 since I3 is constant, but we subtract the term 1 half P times I3 minus 1, which is a Lagrange multiplier because this term is 0 when I3 equals 1. And that's because if the pressure can't change the volume, then the pressure can't do any work on an incompressible solid. So why did we add it? Well, even though this term does not affect the energy or the work, it does affect the stress when we differentiate the strain energy. So PRS now becomes 2 del W del I1 del I1 del CRS, which we previously showed to be delta RS, plus 2 times del W del I2 times I2 del CRS, which we previously derived, minus P times del XR del XI times del XS del XI, which turns out to be the inverse of the right Cauchy Green deformation tensor. And this term, when converted into Cauchy stress, just becomes minus P delta IJ. In other words, the effect of introducing this Lagrange multiplier term into the strain energy function does not change the strain energy because pressure can't do work on an incompressible solid, but it does change the stress, and it changes the stress by subtracting a hydrostatic pressure from the diagonals of the Cauchy stress tensor. We now need to be able to solve for that extra unknown, but since we've introduced an extra equation, the problem is still has the right number of knowns and unknowns, and we generally end up using the equilibrium equations to solve for the value of P. Now in practice, most soft tissues are in fact somewhat compressible. They change their volume a little bit under load, and this is mainly due to displacement of fluid from the vessels or lymphatics or perhaps the interstitium under the load. Uh, however, the magnitude of that volumetric strain is small compared with the other strains, and so we usually treat that term separately. So again, for an isotropic material, we could add the term such as minus k times j minus 1 log j, where j in this case is the determinant of f, or the square root of the third principal invariant. This term allows us to specify a value of k that's high relative to the coefficients of the other response terms, with the result that changes in j are not very large, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the volume of the material can change somewhat uh, during, uh, during loading. So to summarize, here are the governing equations for nonlinear elasticity. We have a strain displacement relation for the strain, in this case the Lagrangian green strain, which is given as a function of the deformation gradient f, which is directly related to this displacements, which are the difference between the deformed and undeformed coordinates. Then we have the constitutive law for a hyperelastic material that says that the second piola kirchhoff stress components are equal to the derivatives of a strain energy function with respect to these Lagrangian green strains. And to recover the Eulerian Cauchy stress, we can use the formula that we introduced that simply transforms from Lagrangian to Eulerian using the deformation gradient tensor that we've already introduced. The Lagrangian form of the conservation of linear momentum looks almost identical to the form that we've seen before, written in terms of the Cauchy stress, but now the nominal stress S uh, is used and we take partial derivatives in the divergence with respect to the undeformed coordinates instead of the deformed coordinates, and that's what the capital D in this divergence means. Or in terms of our piola kirchhoff stress, this is the divergence of P times F transpose. Again, 
where the capital D in the divergence means that the partial derivatives and the computation of the divergence are with respect to the original undeformed coordinates. So this is a fully Lagrangian expression of the conservation of linear momentum. And then conservation of angular momentum is just equivalent to what we've seen for the Cauchy stress uh, and it requires that the second Piola-Kirchhoff stress, but not the first Piola-Kirchhoff stress, is, is symmetric. Then finally, if we are introducing incompressibility, we made use of the conservation of mass. Uh, in the case when uh, the density is constant, the determinant of f is equal to 1. So these are the governing equations for nonlinear elasticity, and we'll proceed in class to use these to solve some simple problems. In practice, there are very few problems that for which analytic solutions can be obtained, uh, but there are good numerical methods available to solve these uh, problems on a computer.